For seven years there had been too little rain. The prairies were dust. Day after day, summer after summer, the scorching winds blew the dust and the sun was brassy in a yellow sky. Crop after crop failed. Again and again, the barren land must be mortgaged for taxes and food and next year's seed. The agony of hope ended when there was no harvest and no more credit. No more money to pay interest and taxes. The banker took the land. Then the bank failed. In the seventh year, a mysterious catastrophe was worldwide. All banks failed. From coast to coast, the factories shut down and business ceased. This was the panic. It was not a depression. The year was 1893, when no one heard of depressions. Everyone knew about panics. There had been panics in 1797, 1820, 1835, 1857, 1873. A panic was nothing new to Grandpa. He had seen them before. This one was no worse than usual, he said. Nothing like as bad as wartime. Now we're all safe in our beds. Nobody was rampaging but Coxey's armies. All the way from California, Coxey's armies of unemployed were seizing the railroad trains, jam-packing the cars and running them full speed, open throttle, hell for leather, toward Washington. They came roaring into the towns yelling, Justice for the working man! and stopped and swarmed out, demanding plenty to eat and three days' rations to take with them or they'd burn the town. People gave them everything to get rid of them. In all the cities, federal troops were guarding the government buildings. I was seven years old and in the second reader at school, but I had read the third reader and the fourth and Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels. The Chicago Inner Ocean came every week and after the grown-ups read it, I did. I did not understand all of it, but I read it. It said that east of the Mississippi there were no trains on the railroad tracks. The dispatchers had dispatched every train to the far away east to keep them safe from Coxey's armies. So now the armies were disbanded and walking on foot toward Washington, robbing and raiding and stealing and begging for food as they went. For a long time I had been living with Grandpa and Grandma and the aunts in Dismet because nobody knew what would become of my father and mother. Only God knew. They had diphtheria, a hard word and dreadful. I did not know what it was exactly, only that it was big and black and it meant I might never see my father and mother again. Then my father, manlike, would not listen to reason and stay in bed. Grandma almost scolded about that to the ants. Bound and determined to get out and take care of the stock he was, and for working too hard too soon, he was stricken. Now he would be bedridden all of his days and what would Laura do, with me on her hands besides? But when I saw my father again, he was walking slowly. He limped through the rest of his 90 years and was never as strong as he had been. We lived then in our own house in Dismet, away from Main Street, where only a footpath went through the short brown grasses. It was a big rented house and empty. Upstairs and down, it was dark and full of stealthy little sounds at night. But then the lamp was lighted in the kitchen where we lived. Our cook stove and table and chairs were there. The bed was in an empty room, and at bedtime my trundle bed was brought into the warmth from the cook stove. We were camping, my mother said. Wasn't it fun? I knew she wanted me to say yes, so I did. To me, everything was simply what it was. I was going to school while my father and mother worked. Reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, penmanship filled days almost unbearably happy with achievements satisfying Miss Barrow's strict standards. Procrastination is the thief of time I wrote 20 times in my penmanship book without error or blot. And evil communications corrupt good manners. And sweet are the uses of adversity. Every T and D exactly twice as tall as a vowel, and every L exactly three times as tall. Every T crossed, every I dotted. All the way home down the long board walk in the late afternoon, we, we diligent scholars warmly remembered our adored Miss Barrow's grave, well done. And often we sang a rollicking song. It was the song of those days, heard more often than ta ra ra boom -dee 
My Aunt Grace, a jolly big girl, often sang it. Sometimes my mother did. And nearly all the time you could hear some man or boy whistling it. Oh, Dakota land, sweet Dakota land, as on the burning soil I stand. And look away across the plains, I wonder why it never rains. Till Gabriel blows his trumpet sound and says the rain has gone around. We don't live here, we only stay here, because we're too poor to get away. My mother did not have to go out to work. She was married. My father was the provider. He got his day's work here and there. He could drive a team, he could carpenter or paint or spell a storekeeper at dinner time. And once he was on a jury downtown. My mother and I slept at grandma's then. Every night the jury was kept under lock and key and my father could not come home. But he got his keep and two dollars every day for five straight weeks and he brought back all that money. My mother worked to save. She sewed at the dressmakers from six o'clock to six o'clock every day but Sunday and then came home to get supper. I had peeled the potatoes thin and set the table. I was not allowed to touch the stove. One day my mother made 60 good firm buttonholes in one hour. 60 minutes. Nobody else could work so well, so fast. And every day, six days a week, she earned a dollar. They were going to the land of the big red apple when they had enough money. Someone named Mr. Sherwin had gone there and seen it. So the pictures that he sent back were true. Pictures of huge red apples and rows and rows of smaller trees and of buildings confusingly named Mansfield. They were not a man's field, and the print under them said they were the gem city of the Ozarks. Around and under these pictures on beautiful shiny paper, I read that, that the gem city of o the Ozarks was in the land of the Big Red Apple in Missouri. Now I knew three mi states, Mississippi, Wisconsin, and Missouri. Paul said scornfully that it wasn't Wisconsin, it was Wisconsin, but Wis didn't make sense to me. Paul and George Cooley were coming with us to the land of the Big Red Apple. Paul was oldest, George was next. I was the only youngest, but they had to let me boss because I was a girl. We had always known each other. Their father had two big teams and two big covered wagons, and Paul would be allowed to drive one of them. He said his father said he could. I did not want to believe this, but I knew that Paul would never lie. He was a big boy, too, going on ten years old. My mother had saved one hundred dollars to take to the land of the Big Red Apple. All those dollars were in one piece of paper named a hundred dollar bill. She hid it in her writing desk, a fascinating wooden box which my father had made and polished so shiny smooth that stroking it was rapture. It opened on little brass hinges to lie spread out flat and be a slanting green felt surface to write on. At the top was a darling wooden tray to hold my mother's pearl-handled pen, and beside this was an inkwell, and the green felt was on a lid that lifted up on tinier hinges to reveal the place for writing paper underneath it. I was allowed to see and touch the desk only when my mother opened it. The hundred-dollar bill was a secret. My mother locked it in the desk. Mr. and Mrs. Cooley knew, perhaps Paul and George did, but we must not talk about it. I must never, never speak one word about the hundred dollar bill not to anyone never no matter what happened in the shade of the big empty house my father painted our covered wagon it was really better than a covered wagon it had been a two-seated hack though now it had only the front seat my father painted it shiny black he made a flat top for it of black oil cloth and put straight curtains of the black oil cloth on both sides in the back each curtain would roll up when he pulled a rope. Behind the seat he fitted the bed springs and my mother made up the bed on them. At night she would make my bed on the floor in the front seat. She baked two dozen hardtacks for the journey. They were as large as a plate, flat and hard. Being so hard and dry they would not spoil as bread would. It was hardtack to gnaw, but it tasted like a cracker. We were going to make haste driving every day to reach the land of the Big Red Apple and get settled before winter. We could not stop to look for work, but we would need more food on the way, so my father bought a box of asbestos fire mats to trade, or to sell for ten cents apiece. Fire mats were the new thing, unheard of. They looked like round pieces of gray-white pasteboard edged with a narrow strip of tin. Nobody could believe that they would not burn, till my father proved it. 
He would urge doubters to make a hot fire hotter and hotter. Then he laid one of those mats right onto the flames. It would glow red and the watchers would jeer, but that mat came out unharmed. Put one of those fire mats under a pot, my father would say, and the pot would boil bone dry. Not a potato in it would so much as scorch. Every woman alive needed one of those mats. Everything that we were taking all the way was packed under the bed springs first. Next, the things that we would be using, the table and chairs with folding legs and the sheet iron camp stove that my father had made, the hammock that blind Aunt Mary had netted and given to us as a parting present, the writing desk, well wrapped, plates, cups, frying pan, coffee pot, wash basin, water pail, picket ropes and pegs, and the hardtack in its box. My father tied down the black curtain. Outside it, he fastened the hen coop while the hens fluttered and squawked inside the wire netting but soon they would be used to traveling. In the dawn the next morning, we said goodbye to Grandpa and Grandma, to Aunts Mary, Carrie, and Grace, who all stood around to watch us go, though Aunt Mary's beautiful blue eyes could not see us. The mares were hitched to the hack. Their colts, little pet and prince, would follow them. The coolies covered wagons had gone ahead, and Paul was driving the second one. I climbed up over our wagon's wheel and onto the seat by myself. My mother sat beside me. Beside her, my father tightened the lines. Everyone said, Goodbye. Goodbye. Don't forget to write. I won't. I will. You be sure to. Goodbye. And we drove away. Away from Grandma's house with its rag carpets and rocking chair. The hymn books on the organ. My very own footstool away from the chalky schoolroom where angelic Miss Barrows taught kindergarten, primer, first and second readers. Away from the summer sidewalks where grasshoppers hopped in the dry grass and the silver-lined poplar leaves rattled overhead. Away from the gaunt, gray, empty house and from Mrs. Sherwood and her sister who sometimes on sweltering afternoons asked me to fetch ten cents worth of ice cream from the faraway ice cream parlor and shared it with me. Away from DeSmet to the land of the big red apple. My mother made daily notes of our journey in a little five-cent memorandum book, writing with pencil on both sides of the pages, of course. Nobody then wasted paper. This is her record.